The Balfour Declaration is almost exactly 100 years old. It was a declaration given by one people to a second people, the land of a third people. Uh, it was unique in even imperial history because Britain didn't even possess Palestine, which was the country in question, uh, as an imperial possession. But they nonetheless promised it to the Zionist movement without, of course, consulting either the British or the Jewish people in the world, most of whom at that time were not Zionists and had no wish whatsoever to go and live in the Arab world. And, of course, the least to be consulted were the Palestinians whose land it was. Balfour was the British Foreign Secretary and he uh, promised to the Zionists that Palestine could be a, a national home for the Jewish people. Although even the declaration, grotesque and unjust as it was, made it clear that nothing must be done that prejudices the rights of the indigenous existing population there, which was overwhelmingly uh, Muslim and Christian Arab. So even Balfour's uh, declaration doesn't justify what subsequently happened, but it was an unjustifiable declaration in the first place because it was not for Britain to give away other people's land and it was not the wish of the Jewish people at that time in any case to go and live in the Arab world. Jewish and Zionist are entirely different things. So when we say we are against Zionism, we are against a political ideology. We are not against the religion professed by the people who support that ideology. Uh, we are, in, as a matter of fact, it would, be, it would be sinful for me, haram for me, to hate Jews. And I don't. As a matter of fact, on an individual level, I, I love them. But a political ideology, being against a political ideology, is not the same thing as being against the religion uh, of the people who have that ideology. And to wish to see an end to that political ideology is not, it's not to say you want to see the end of the people who have it. For example, Britain and the United States spent decades being against communism, another political ideology. They were against the Soviet Union, which was a state, but they weren't against the Russian people. They didn't want to kill the Russians. They wanted to liberate the Russians from an ideology, a political system. And that's all we're saying about Zionism. Zionism is a political ideology. Most Zionists are not Jews. Many Jews are not Zionists, either for religious reasons or political reasons. I could take you to Hackney where an entire community lives of very strictly orthodox Jewish people who are completely against Israel and completely against Zionism. Equally, many of my own comrades are people of uh, Jewish background. They might not be uh, particularly religious beyond high days and holy days, uh, but they are culturally uh, Jewish and they come from, oftentimes, a uh, left-wing, progressive Jewish background, which, as I said earlier, is what was the hegemonic uh, political viewpoint of Jews before the rise and triumph of, uh, of Zionism. So, Judaism is a religion. Anyone can convert to it. A Chinaman, an Ethiopian, me, any of us can become Jewish. We have to ask three times and it's not as easy as it is to convert to other religions, but we can. And there, that gives automatically the lie to the idea that to be Jewish is to be of a particular race or nation. Uh, and the mere glance at Israeli settlers on the television or Israeli soldiers invading Gaza makes that clear. Most of these people are North American or European. Some of them are black Africans. Some of them are from China. Some of them are converts. The person who assaulted me outside this very door in August of 2014 
uh, and put me into hospital with serious injuries, had converted to Judaism only weeks before, but automatically gained the legal right to go and live in Palestine on somebody else's land, even though he was a British Christian who converted to Judaism. He has no connection whatsoever to the land of Palestine, still less land that's owned by somebody else, but he automatically gained the right to citizenship in Palestine. Whilst Palestinians in their millions who still have the keys to their own houses are not permitted to return. How crazy is that? Theodore Herzl was a European who wanted to gather the Jews of the world to found a European colony, just like all the other European colonies that were at that time being founded in Africa and Asia and elsewhere. He thought, well, if the British and the Germans and the French and the Belgians and all the others, if they, the Dutch, if they can have foreign colonies, why can't we, with our superior uh, education, superior levels of technology, even military power potentially, why can't we go to someone else's country and found a white European settlement there? And they were not at all fussy about where that settlement should be. And they negotiated seriously with the British government over several places in the world that had a narrow escape from being the uh, settler state of Israel. Uganda, for example. They seriously negotiated with the British for a part of Uganda, which they would uh, found their uh, Jewish European settler state in. But there were many others, the Seychelles, uh, Patagonia in Argentina, uh, these were all serious propositions for the founding of Israel. The idea being that British Jews were not British, French Jews were not French, German Jews not German. And this is something therefore that Zionism has in common with anti-Semites and racists. You see, for me, a British Jew is the same as a British Catholic, a British Protestant, a British Seventh-day Adventist. Their religion has nothing to do with the fact that they are or are not British. The racists don't believe that. The anti-Semites don't believe that. Even the fascists later didn't believe that. But also the Zionists didn't believe that. They believed that a French Jew was not French and should leave France and should go and live somewhere else, either Uganda or Patagonia or the Seychelles or, as it turned out, Palestine. This is, I think, the other side of the coin of the anti-Semite racists. You're saying that no matter how many hundreds of years, millennia even, we live in a place, we are not of that place, and we don't have the same rights as the people in that place or responsibilities as the people in that place. That's a profoundly dangerous mindset. And most Jews agreed with what I've just said. When Theodor Herzl and the Congress of Basel uh, in the late 19th century declared this Zionist project, the vast majority of Jews in the world, I mean well over 90% of them, rejected Zionism and in fact were at the forefront in progressive politics in Europe at that time. The Marx was a Jew, Trotsky was a, a Jew, uh, Einstein, Epstein, all these people were non-Zionist Jews and they were icons of progressive thought, left-wing thought. Many were communist, many were socialist, many were trade unionists in London, for example. The East End of London was a fortress of, uh, of um, progressive, uh, liberal left-wing thought and action and uh, Zionism poisoned all of that and we now have a situation where the great majority of Jews though by no means them all uh, support the Zionist idea that they should leave their own countries and go and live in somebody else's country even when they don't actually do it because of course most Jews in the world do not live in what they call Israel and have no wish or intention of doing so. 
the majority of Jews in the world live in the United States or Europe and are quite happy to do so, but they're nonetheless mainly supportive of the foundation of the settler state. Israel is ethnically cleansing the Palestinian people because it must, because their entire thesis is that Palestine was a land without people which should be taken by them who were a people without land. And that gigantic lie, one of the biggest lies in all human history, is so obviously untrue once you get there. Even then, when the Zionist settlers began to arrive and the Zionist movement began to pick up pace, well over 90% of the population of Palestine were Arab, Muslim and Christian. There were some Jews there who had lived there for centuries in peace, side by side with the Muslims and the Christians. As a matter of fact, Salah ad-Din, when he liberated Jerusalem, ordered the protection of the holy places of the Christians and the Jews in the holy city. And yet he just fought a very long war against the Crusaders, uh, a very bloody and uh, murderous war against the Crusaders. But as soon as he occupied Jerusalem and liberated it from the Crusaders, he made it clear, as Muslims must, that the protection of the people of the book, the protection of the holy places of others, is an article of faith for Muslims. So there had been always a smallish number of religious Jews living in Jerusalem in peace with all the others. But Zionism began to pick up steam. It arrived there and it found that this was not a land without a people. There were plenty of people. And they all saw themselves as Palestinian first and as Arab second. And this was an existential challenge to Zionism. That's why hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, 800,000, were driven from Palestine into refugee camps in what we call the Nakba, the catastrophe. And those 800,000 have now become many, many millions, 1948, to 2016, the high birth rate of the Palestinian people has become millions. There are maybe 13 or 14 million Palestinians now uh, alive in the world who consider themselves to be Palestinians and they still have the key and the title deed to the land that was uh, stolen from them. Uh, so ethnic cleansing is the only way to solve this. In, in today's world, you couldn't, even if they wanted to, murder all the Palestinians still there in Gaza and the West Bank and inside what's called the Green Line, the original 1948 UN delineated border. There are maybe 7 million Palestinians. You cannot murder them all. So what's the only thing you can do is to drive them out. And there are many sections of the Zionist population uh, and political organizations and leaders who are endlessly coming up with new ways to drive these people out. You make life as bad for them as you possibly can and hope that they will take off somewhere else and disappear. The problem for them is the Palestinian people, far from disappearing, are more visible today than they have ever been. I was at President Arafat, God rest his soul, I was at his deathbed in Paris. When I came out after his demise, in the early morning light, I was confronted by a battery of maybe 500 television stations, cameras. The entire world was fixated on this physically small man the leader of a small people which didn't even have a state, didn't have a country, but the whole world was at his, uh, the site of his demise. Why? Because the Palestinian people are now a major, major factor in world politics, in international affairs. I happen to think 
that he takes the great share of the responsibility for that achievement. So the Palestinians are bigger now than they were before, more numerous than they were before, more indispensable to any solution in the area than ever before, and they're not going to go away. Arafat used to say, we are not going to go into the museum of X nations so that people can come and look at our clothes and our cooking uh, utensils and our artifacts. We will not go into the museum of X nations. And that's definitely true. Well, the United Nations, of course, has a special responsibility in all of this for two reasons. Israel was brought into existence by a decision of the United Nations. It was the United Nations that gave birth to Israel in 1948. And yet, Israel is in defiance of more broken United Nations resolutions than any other country in the world. In fact, more than all other countries in the world put together. And secondly, they have a special responsibility because the Palestinian people, millions of them, are officially refugees. And the official legal responsibility in the world for refugees is the United Nations. Now, there are some United Nations agencies like UNRWA in the camps, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, that struggle manfully to do their duty to feed and school and give medical uh, help to these Palestinian refugees, but their budgets are cut to the bone and quite often their officials in despair at their inability for logistical and financial reasons to undertake their duties to protect the Palestinian people. So the UN has a special responsibility, but it has not lived up to that responsibility. It should be saying to Israel, listen, we gave birth to you and you have responsibilities as a member state of the United Nations, and you must obey them. But of course, they never ask, and if they asked, Israel would never agree, and uh, when they don't agree, no sanction or punishment at all uh, is forthcoming. The situation can be compared, contrasted, with Iraq, for example, which was bled white by the most draconian, murderous, United Nations economic sanctions because they said Iraq was in defiance of United Nations resolutions. As it turned out, of course, Iraq was not in defiance of any United Nations resolutions, yet a million Iraqis were killed under those sanctions. Or more recently, Iran was put under draconian sanctions on the issue of nuclear weapons, even though Iran does not have any nuclear weapons, yet Israel has hundreds of nuclear weapons, illegally acquired, undeclared, unsanctioned, unpunished, whilst Iran with none was sanctioned and punished. So you can see the double standard that runs through virtually everything that is connected to the word Israel in the international political and legal system. World governments turn a blind eye to the suffering of the Palestinian people and will go on doing so until their people make that impossible for them. Uh, so I want to make that point because it's too easy just to blame the governments. Uh, if the governments felt there were votes to be lost in turning a blind eye to the Palestinian people, they'd stop turning a blind eye. Uh, I can tell you that as someone who's been in elected politics for almost 30 years. If a lot of people in your constituency are really, really concerned about something, you A, know about it, and B, have to take account of it. So let's blame ourselves first and foremost. But the world governments support Israel, even though they no longer love it. I mean, we got, a, we got an insight into what the world leaders really think when a microphone was left on in the south of France at a G8 summit, when President Sarkozy was the leader of France and President Obama uh, said to
to, uh, uh, or rather the other way around, President Sarkozy said to President Obama, this Netanyahu, he's such a liar, I can't look at his face. And President Obama answered, you can't look at his face. What about me? I have to deal with the guy every day. That's what they really think of Netanyahu. But their public stand and the role of their countries vis-a-vis -vis Israel is very different. They continue to give it political and diplomatic and propaganda cover for its crimes. They continue to refuse to hold it to account for those crimes. They continue to apply the double standard we've been talking about. Uh, and that will go on until we ourselves bring it to an end. So it's not good enough uh, to remember Palestine in your prayers. You should do, but it's not enough. It's not good enough to think about the Palestinian people only when Israel invades Gaza or when some particular outrage happens. And it's not good enough to think that tears for the Palestinian children means anything at all. A stone would weep at the sight of what happens to the Palestinian children. But those tears are worth nothing if you don't follow them with determination and action to change the situation. Now, I've been here before, throughout the 1970s and in the 1980s, even in apartheid South Africa, underground, as an agent for the African National Congress, I worked to help bring down the apartheid system in South Africa. And it was brought down between the hammer of resistance by the South African people themselves and the anvil of international solidarity, meaningful international solidarity, boycotting, divesting, taking sanctions, demanding sanctions, making South Africa such a dirty word that no respectable person would dare say that they supported apartheid, that they thought apartheid South Africa was a good thing. We haven't yet achieved that in Palestine, and yet the fate of the Palestinian people is even worse than the fate of the black people in South Africa. David Cameron is no different to uh, all British prime ministers. They have all supported the uh, Zionist state. They have all refused to act on its crimes. The one small thing I could say in David Cameron's favor is the only political leader in Britain, government or opposition, who described Gaza as an open air prison camp. And the Zionists were very angry about that. But he didn't take it back. He hasn't withdrawn it. Uh, so at least he had the guts to describe Gaza uh, exactly as it is, and is obviously so to anyone who observes it. But Cameron is a dyed-in-the-wool supporter of the Zionist political ideology, the apartheid state. And Cameron was a previous apologist for the apartheid state of South Africa, so that shouldn't come as a very big surprise. But all British Prime Ministers, Labour and Conservative, have underwritten uh, the crimes of the Zionist state. They have sold weapons uh, to the Zionist state. They have engaged in military and intelligence cooperation with the Zionist state. And even when that Zionist state stole the passports of British citizens in order to murder a Palestinian leader in Dubai, we ordered the Mossad chief in London out of the country, and when his plane arrived in Tel Aviv, the new Mossad chief for London got on board and flew back to London and continued uh, uh, to uh, ply his trade here. So uh, Cameron is as bad, not better, not worse than all the others. Apartheid South Africa was beyond the pale, and everybody knew it. And eventually, before it collapsed, nobody would have anything to do with them. And we should have nothing to do with Israeli supporters of Zionism. Of course, we have to embrace those people in Israel who are with us, whether Jewish or not Jewish, and 
many of the finest, bravest fighters for Palestine in the world are in Israel. You see them on the television. They try and stand in front of the bulldozers or they stand to try and uh, stop uh, demolition of houses or they carefully record crimes and take them to court. And I know many of these people. They are heroes. But an Israeli supporter of Zionism and the apartheid state is beyond the pale. Social media has transformed the landscape. Everybody knows that almost all newspapers, almost all television stations are, are absolutely supportive of Israel, absolutely embroiled in the double standards to which I referred earlier, uh, treat Israeli lives and Palestinian lives in an entirely different way. Uh, Israelis are killed, Palestinians die as if uh, by chance or by uh, any other means other than that somebody killed them. So you'll routinely see in the news that uh, four Palestinians died on the West Bank, but one Israeli, he's always killed. Uh, the blood of the Israelis is far more valuable to the international media than the blood of Palestinians. These three young children that were killed on the beach in Gaza, playing football, for example. Uh, this story was buried almost as quickly as the children were buried. That would not have been the case if the uh, shoe had been on the other foot. Uh, so in the absence of any fair coverage of this issue, even balanced coverage, even a little biased, in the absence of all of that, uh, people have taken to the new tools that they now have. And I, I have one million followers on social media. I am endlessly, daily, putting out the Palestinian case. And that million becomes many millions by the time everyone has shared and so on. Uh, and I'm by no means the only person doing that. We, at the time of the latest full-scale war on Gaza in 2014. We rallied hundreds of thousands of people just in Britain, almost entirely by social media. People learned of our demonstrations, where they were starting, where they were leaving, who was speaking, almost entirely uh, through social media. So, of course, the supporters of Israel know this, and they engage, sometimes even pay, and we don't have to take my word for that, They've admitted it themselves. They pay Israeli students and other students around the world to be effectively trolls on uh, Twitter, for example, and on Facebook, endlessly lying, endlessly smearing, libeling, defaming anyone who stands up for the Palestinian people. And sometimes it works. Some people are intimidated off the platform or intimidated into leaving the subject alone. But uh, we are many and they are few. Uh, we are hundreds of millions and they are a much, much smaller number. The number of people now is different when I was young, by the way. You know, I became involved in the Palestinian issue in 1975. In the mid-60s to the mid-70s, almost everybody actually liked Israel. It had a really good image. It was swinging, it was cool, there was free love, communal eating, kibbutz, uh, which were said to be uh, examples of uh, cooperative living and working and so on. Israel had a very high reputation and many followers. And to say, as I did in 1975, that you were a supporter of the PLO was a very controversial thing. Indeed, I could show you my scars that I've carried since those days. Uh, but now that's completely changed. Almost nobody loves Israel anymore. Of course, those Jewish people who are totally committed to Zionism, it's not by no means all of the Jews, as I said. There are many religious Jews against it and many secular and leftist Jews against it, but the majority of Jews are in favor of it. They're the, almost the last people left who really love Israel. Even the evangelical Christians in the United States, who are in their tens of millions and who are big supporters of Israel, are not big supporters of Israel because they love Jews. They're big supporters of Israel because they expect that it will bring Jesus back 
and then all the Jews will be forced to convert or be killed. Uh, so they don't love Jews. Anybody that thinks George Bush loved Jews never visited his golf club where there are no Jewish members at all. So they're Zionists, but not Jews and not liking Jews, sometimes even hating Jews. Mr. Balfour himself, about whom I've spoken, wanted all the Jews in England to leave because he didn't like Jews, not because he supported their rights to go and live in Palestine, but because he wanted to see their backs leaving the British ports. Um, so we have this weird phenomenon that people who don't like Jews uh, are with Israel and people who love Jews like me are against Israel. And we are the ones accused of being anti-Semites, which is of course utterly ridiculous, risible. What will happen? I don't have a crystal ball. I used to think that I could see the day when I would myself walk in a free Palestine. Now I can't even get into occupied Palestine, neither in the West Bank nor Gaza, because I'm banned from Egypt and banned by Israel from crossing into uh, occupied Palestine. Frankly, I no longer think I will live to see uh, a free Palestine, but by the grace of God, I have many sons and they're young. And I'm sure that one day they will walk in a free Palestine. And if you see them, just tell them that you remember their old man.